Hey, this is, um, my name is Justice Condor, and this is class two of uh, Coder Monks. Um, the first one was a dry run, um, just to figure out how everything was working in all this. And um, this week's going to be a little different as we're just doing a uh, screen share. Um, but I think you'll find the material extremely interesting. It, it, it really lays the foundation for what's coming up because um, you can't appreciate uh, computer programming without appreciating a computer and you can't appreciate a computer without understanding what is logic and rationality and computation and so we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive here um, and this will lay a foundation for what's coming up so definitions of logic um, uh, if you look up uh, logic in you know the Oxford English Dictionary or, or some major dictionary online it's really interesting in the you'll find under multiple examples this tight connection between um, between logic proper and computer programming. So in this instance, uh, logic is reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of validity. That strict principles of validity, that's where you get into formal language, you know. But then right with it, a, you have a, a system or set of principles underlying the arrangements of elements in a computer or electronic device so as to perform a specific task. So they're, um, they're right connected. Um, one thing I, I do want to mention too is, um, and we'll get into this a little bit, but uh, that there are certain ontological, that is like philosophical prerequisites to speaking about logic. You can start with logic and say, yeah, everything's fine, but there are even certain things that have to be true in the universe for a logic to exist and to be the way we believe it to be, meaning that certain things must be or not be, given certain starting points. So there are um, basically the three laws. I mean, things get, certainly get far more complex than this, but there are three laws of logic. The law of identity, P is P, which you think, why does if that need to even be said, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, this is an axiomatic system, right? Axioms, you know, this was made famous by Euclid, where it was like, hey, we can take all of geometry and boil it down to the most basic uh, uh, ass uh, assumptions, and then from there, everything else flows. So P is P. That means you can't assert that P is not P. Um, secondly, we have the law of non-contradiction, which is P is not non-P. And the law of excluded middle, which means that if you say either P or non-P, then there's nothing in the middle. It either is or it isn't. So what I mentioned earlier about certain prerequisites in the universe that must be true for logic to even be a thing, and I mentioned in our first dry run class that there's just some Christian apologetics throughout this, is um, there's an argument for the existence of God that applies to a lot of stuff. It's called TAG, the transcendental. Um, argument for the existence of God and that uh, that argument in reference to logic goes something like this it says logical absolutes exist these laws of logic are conceptual in nature not physical so logic cannot be produced by a rock you know it's not saying that you know, something falls or you know thermodynamics or something about the world it's like it's cognitive right it's intellectual the laws of logic don't exist anywhere in the physical world. So the third, because these absolutes are conceptual, they must also have been conceived in a mind. However, these laws are perfect and absolute, and human minds are not perfect or absolute. Logical absolutes are true everywhere and are not dependent on human minds. Therefore, these laws must exist in a perfect, absolute, transcendental mind. That mind is the mind of God. Um, so to make it really simple, because that sounds a little bit can sound a little bit extended, right? It's simply to say this, that when you think about rationality, there must be a rationality behind everything. It's not just you imposing a, uh, your opinion on things, right? If you're coming to the world and saying, hey, I'm, fine, I'm looking for rationality, rationality must be there, or it's just a figment of your imagination. So just another way in which God demonstrates his glory and that even the things that we tend to think in our nature are fundamental to the world and don't have anything to do with him. His existence and attributes are prerequisites and even, even for those things to exist.
So who was the first, you know, if we were to go through a history of logic and computation, where did it start? Well, you can say it started with Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotle's kind of a big deal. He's like considered the first scientist, the first logician, the first, I mean, this guy had it going on. And um, this pit image right here is taken from the famous uh, painting of the School of Athens. And you can see that um, Plato is there pointing with his finger up, pointing to, you know, the, that everything comes from the ideal. The, the idea, put it in a really crass way, is that like in heaven, not like a Christian heaven, but like in this Greco-Roman heaven, there's like these perfect items, the perfect things, geometrical, whatever they are, perfect concepts. And then everything down here is like just a shadow of them, right? Where with Aristotle, who is his uh, student for 20 years, said, hey, we need to look at what's here and extrapolate what's happening here to get to truth without postulating these really weird idea of things in, the, um, in this uh, other realm. <clears throat> so Aristotle championed something called the syllogism. Um, the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy says, Aristotle's logic, especially his theory of the syllogism, has had unparalleled influence on the history of Western thought. And um, so much so that Kant thought that Aristotle had discovered everything there was to know about logic. And historians of logic uh, around the same time basically said that any logician after Aristotle only said anything that was confused, stupid, or dumb, perverse. So for a long time, it was Aristotle had it all figured out. And his entire thing was about the syllogism. So what's a syllogism? Um, and this is how Aristotle put it. A deduction is speech. This is cool because this gets into stuff that people don't normally think of as, as, as um, related to this uh, starting point in logic. A deduction is speech in Greek logos or logos in which certain things having been supposed, something different from those supposed results of necessity because of their being so. So, inference. So this syllogism it took its form in this way. In every syllogism, there was a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And this is an example of one. The major premise would be all books from that store are new. A minor premise would be these books are from that store, and the conclusion would be, therefore, these books are new. The most famous is, all men are moral, mortal. Uh, Plato's a man, therefore, Plato's mortal. Um, they certainly got more sophisticated than this, because when you have negation and some men and things like that, but he could basically break down all of logic into these like four, four kind of categories of types of forms that you could say things. So... We skip forward all the way to Leibniz, um, 1946, because like I said, for a long time, everyone was like, Aristotle has it all figured out. Uh, Leibniz was um, a pretty impactful person in history. Very few people realize how significant his contribution was, and people don't think of Leibniz when they think of Isaac Newton. Whereas Leibniz actually produced um, calculus independent from Isaac Newton, and the way in which he did it, some will argue, is actually better, which is um, pretty wild. Leibniz was a German polymath, which means he just studied everything and knew everything, and a philosopher. Um, he occupies a really prominent place in the history of mathematics and the history of philosophy. Um, he became one of the most prolific inventors in the field of mechanical calculators. That's another thing that's going to come up is there's a real distinction between a calculator and a computer. We've kind of, at this point in history, been able to conflate them because most calculators have computers in them and um, all computers are able to do the work of a calculator. But in the beginning, it was not this way. Um, pretty much you just had calculators and he made mechanical calculators. Um... So, this statement from Leibniz, this concept, is really the primordial 
ground of computation and computing, of executable rational thought. Um, he said, the only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as those of the mathematicians so that we can find our error at a glance. And when there are disputes among persons, we can simply say, let us calculate without further ado to see who is right. And he basically had this, talked about this idea that two people are arguing and at the same time they stop and look at each other and like point their fingers up in the air and say, let us calculate. And they run off to this machine and put in their facts and figures about what they're discussing and start cranking this handle. And, um, and then the answer comes out and they're like, oh, you owe me a beer, you know, like you, you were right, you know. <laughs> but there just wasn't the capability to even do something like this. Now, Leibniz created something similar, similar to symbolic logic and wrote things that can now be read as groping attempts to get at symbolic logic. Um, unfortunately, his writings were not published until modern logic had emerged. Oh, you know, so it's pretty wild. This guy invents calculus. Oh, he invents symbolic logic, and he really doesn't get credit for any of it. So shout out to Leibniz. Um, he's got it going on. So, um, not to skip ahead, um, so it's not until the second half of the 19th century that a new branch of logic takes shape, mathematical logic. Its aim was to link logic with the ideas of arithmetic and algebra in order to make logic accessible to the algebraic techniques of formula, formulaic manipulation. Deductive reasoning could then be reduced to algebraic formulations. And the, the, auth, the person who made this possible, his name is George Boole. Um, he invented Boolean algebra, which reduced categorical logic to algebra. This is a game changer. You see, the, the, we had adding and subtracting, even multiplying and division and all this in a machine. But the idea that you could convert terms of rationality and reasoning to symbols and then compute them. Not just reason about them and mess around with them, but compute them. Um, Boole realized Leibniz's conception of an algebra of thought. With only numbers 0 and 1, so he invented this, 0 and 1, Boole built up an entire algebra, turning logic into a fully symbolic practice, which could be computed easily. So easy that its implementation into a computational binary framework made Boole made a Boolean circuits possible. So this is a prerequisite to the circuits that are running in this computer right now. And so he basically operated on three things. Uh, and or not. That's it. And or not. Um, and, you know, he, he's, he's making formal what is, looks very similar to what Aristotle was doing um, informally were executable. Um, so you can see, this looks simple here, like, yeah, big deal. But this junk gets pretty hardcore. This is, this is the complexity that gets introduced that it is computable in the sense that a machine can run this now. Now, um, we'll kind of stop for a minute and say, there are two things happening at the same time right now. There's the one, which is, how do you take rationality and turn it into a executable language. Um, but people are still making, quote unquote, what we consider now computers at this point, except they're not, what they are is they're giant calculators. And they're not running binary. And I want to look at a few of those. Um, my man right here, Charles Babbage, he is arguably the inventor of the, the very first computer. And this guy is close to my heart because um, he, this was before the idea of even an electrical computer. This was a machine, um, a giant machine. Um, it was called the difference engine. And the idea was it could, major industries and factories uh, would could build this thing and um, it could be used by the military to figure out trajectories and warfare and for missiles and stuff like this. But one of my favorite quotes from Charles Babbage, just to show you how snarky of a guy this is, and I just... I love this quote, especially when you interact with them, non-developers, and they ask stuff like this. He says, um, on two occasions I've been asked, 
pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? <laughs> and he says, I am not able rightly to comprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. Because <laughs> these business guys would come around and see him running his machine, and they would ask him these silly questions. So this was a um, difference engine. Um, he, he went on to, you know, he received large sums of money from, I think it was the, the uh, British scientific, you know, established organization. Like, here's $7,000 to build this huge calculation machine for science and stuff. He went on to try to build the successor to this, which was the analytic engine, far more sophisticated. He was not able to build it. When we look back at the plans, this thing was about the size of a steam locomotive, okay? And the reason why he was not able to build it is because the machining tolerances necessary for the parts of this machine, of this, you know, how, how uh, accurate the pieces had to be, they could not reproduce them. Um, it's kind of interesting and cool because I was a machinist for um, about six years, and we routinely machine things with tenths, Tenths of a thousandth of tolerance. Um, is, that's how accurate they need to be. But that was only possible because we were using CNC, computer-controlled machines. Well, I'll try to do that before you have computers. So, um, uh, as, a, as a theoretical concept, the, the idea of the analytical engine and its logical de design couldn't, couldn't be overstated how, how enormously important those things were. Um, this is the first realization that by mechanical means it might be possible to program complicated algorithms. Um, the analytic engine had in principle all the important components, memory, processor, input, output, all that, that are present in a modern day computer system. So this, uh, for this reason, Babbage has strong claim to be the inventor of the first uh, modern computer. Now remember what I said, these are modern computers in the sense of giant calculators. Um, two more, there's ENIAC, they called it the Great Brain. This is a big machine, still using decibel. This is not, um, this is no binary, not doing a, 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 a rational calculation, just uh, calculating. And, and then uh, Harvard's Mark I, you can see here, uh, these are monsters. See the giant drive shaft leading all around there? It's nuts. So then we get to the game changer. We saw that Boole in, in brought thought into um, symbolism. Claude Shannon uh, basically opens the modern world. He observed that one could apply the rules of Boole's algebra to electrical circuits. And he introduced switching algebra as a way to analyze and design circuits by algebraic means in terms of logic gates. Um, at, when he was 21, working on a master's degree at MIT, he wrote his thesis demonstrating that you can make electrical circuits uh, be instances of Boole's uh, Boolean algebra. And here we see kind of the progression of things where at the bottom here we have the Venn diagrams which are representative of oh this is kind of what Aristotle was doing and then at the top here we have oh things are getting more sophisticated with we can convert these to binary and crunch them mechanically like in a giant um, spreadsheet or they call them truth table to get the solution to say is this true or not but then here in the middle you see we are get to full these are actual circuits so this is something a lot of people don't realize is this is that's what a computer is. It is tiny machines that are getting half the size and half the price every year and a half um, of thinking circuits. Now um, I'm going to kind of bring things to a close here. Um, what I want to do uh, next week is, in our next session, is kind of go from up to this point we say, okay, wow, now you have, um, you can do cognitive calculations in a machine. And this is really neat. But as far as laying the foundation for 
what is a computer and then how that got us to oh programming language and then let's get into an actual programming language where we're actually writing stuff this is not going to be like a normal um, a typical programming class or at least a computer science class or whatever you're in there for a bit before you have code that you're writing and then even the code that you write most of these you're using a compiler and it's just a lot of uh, respectfully saying this but a lot of garbage of like man just get me in there where I can write something and get feedback and then share it with people I know and you're getting right in the mix of the feedback loop of learning that's essential the feedback loop so it's fun right off the bat you're trying out stuff but these four fellows here the, they the these are the guys that kind of um, were founders of computer science um, David Hilbert came along and said, hey, everyone's making everything like formal. We need to put everything on a formal footing. All of mathematics, everything needs to be computable. Okay? He issued the challenge. Right? And then these fellows here um, answered that challenge in very different ways. And in fact, it's argued, and I think it's accepted, that together, Alan Turing, Godel, and Church, each basically describe what computer science is in a different way. Alan Turing does it in a way that he says, this is a machine, this Turing machine, this abstract machine. It has a head, it has this tape, and it can read symbols and print symbols on this tape. That's a Turing machine, and anything that is computable, the Turing machine can compute it. So that's what we talk about today, anything. Like, oh, it can, it can, it's a machine. And you say, is it Turing complete? Like, can it compute anything that is computable? And that's almost like a challenge of like uh, determining whether something is a, a true machine or not, or a true computer or not. So Alan Turing did it mechanically. Kurt Godel came along and he said, abstractly, what's a function? Okay, so like, you know, what is a function and, and functions within functions and defining a function with another function. And so you get this kind of universal capability of defining things and computing them. Um, and then Church came along and actually wrote, I mean, maybe you could say the first programming language abstractly called the Lambda Calculus, where every single thing was a function within a function. I like to say turtles all the way down, because that's what you have to get to when you need universal computability. Turtles all the way down, um, where you, you never get to a bedrock, which is awesome. It's a, you know, people say developers are architects of universes, entire universes where they set the rules and create the, I, the, the things and the structures and, and um, it's just a tremendously empowering uh, body of knowledge to dive into. So um, I don't want anyone to think they're too late. Sometimes you read this stuff and you're like, oh, this stuff's so deep, I'm too late. It's like we are right on the cusp of the explosion of a distributed uh, machines of intelligence throughout the entire world. Right now, we're already seeing like, hey, there's Siri in your hand. There's Alexa in your house. There's uh, OK Google in your browser. Um, there's Watson for industrial applications uh, as far as in commerce and whatnot. Like All of these are names that are popping up, and they're all designed to do one thing, and that is to hear what you're saying, to compute it, and to give intelligent answers more than just touching a keyboard. Well, this is just just the tip of that, and it's about to become where everything wakes up, called the Internet of Things, where uh, your water bottle, I mean, you buy this stuff on Kickstarter all the time. My water bottle tells me when I'm drinking enough water. My standing desk tells me when I've been sitting down too long. It makes me stand up. You know, it just goes on and on and on. Um, and and the, really, the, this all points to the end. The end game is the technological singularity, which is a computer in every particle of matter, where uh, people who talk about this, they say where the universe wakes up as far as like what is the end game. So you're not too late. Um, so that brings this at this uh, lesson to a close. As far as preparation for next week, um, this is where we're going to get into the interactive uh, part of things. I would say um, everyone needs to bring or have access to a computer, preferably a Mac because I'm of most usefulness in that setting, but if not, then a PC is fine. You just want to make sure you have Chrome installed because we're going to do everything through a browser, which is great because this is another reason why we're doing JavaScript for this class because JavaScript runs everywhere. Any computer, you hop in that browser, you have your full computer right there. And you'll be shocked about the expressive capability you have at your fingertips. Um, 
Uh, and then I, the secondly, I would say create an account on CodePen, CodePen.com. This is a place where you're able to write code, see it update in real time, see what other people's code's doing, and if you like what it's doing, like, oh, wow, it's making this interesting triangle or something, you can fork, make a copy of their code, it puts it in your bucket, and now you can build off of what they did. And it's just completely open-ended. And then lastly, create an account on Stack Overflow. Um, this Google Stack Overflow, this is an account, it's a question and answer website for programming. And so uh, an essential an essential capability of a developer is to be able to ask clear questions and get help. Um, that's pretty much what you'll be doing for the rest of your life, is asking questions and getting help. <laughs> so that's actually part of a, a cultivated skill that Stack Overflow uh, exists to help with. So um, thanks for listening in to uh, Coder Monks. You can catch me at Singularity Hack on Twitter or go right to the um, Coder Monks website and um, you can email there and uh, and um, I'll be pushing all these videos to the YouTube channel. So um, thanks for tuning in.